nice to be back in New Bedford after many years. What I'd like to talk about this evening, this afternoon, really is about the fetus and what we can learn about fetal biology, how it can inform not only our ability to intervene in utero, but may have implications for medicine in general. And literally 40, 50 years after that individual is born. Now, as was appreciated by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who did some of his best thinking when pharmacologically enhanced, the fetus may have a lot to teach us. And in part, that's due to the unique biology of fetal development, as well as the opportunity to intervene at a time uh, when the fetus is most vulnerable. And when you think about it, if you can make a diagnosis, the fetus becomes a patient. And if that's the case, there are a whole host of conditions that are potentially treatable because our capacity to diagnose conditions prenatally has expanded so dramatically. If you think about it, it's only been 30 or 40 years that we've been actually able to tell the sex of a baby before it's been born. And for millennia before that, we had no idea until the time of birth. It's only been 35 years since the very first open fetal surgery was ever performed. And this was done for a baby who had bladder outlet obstruction and would die as a consequence of a lack of lung development because there was no urine to make amniotic fluid. And what we've seen in a relatively short space of time is a dramatic increase in the number of indications for fetal surgery, affecting many different organ systems, from bladder outlet obstruction to congenital pulmonary airway malformation of the lung, spina bifida or myelomeningocele, cervical teratomas, sacrococcygeal tumors, uh, teratomas or tumors of the bottom on babies, and congenital diaphragmatic hernia. But as dramatic as some of these open procedures have been, by understanding the intrinsic fetal development, we can actually fine tune and refine our interventions to be far less invasive and more nuanced. And probably the best example of this is diaphragmatic hernia. So this is a defect in the diaphragm in which the viscera herniate up into the chest and the lungs become hypoplastic or underdeveloped. And the typical way to fix this after the baby's born is to put a patch in the diaphragm after you pull all the chitlins out of the chest and allow these lungs to then develop. But physiologists have known literally for decades that the lungs produce a lot of fluid in utero. And if you were to occlude the trachea, that fluid builds up, the intratracheal pressure rises, and that drives lung development. And this is the basis for an entirely new way to treat this condition. Where the trachea is obstructed, the lungs accumulate fluid, and it actually accelerates lung growth and development. And this is proving to improve the survival of the most severely affected babies. And this is how we do it. This is a three millimeter diameter fetoscope. And at the end of it, you see this balloon, the balloon tip, which when fully inflated, which you can see up above, is only seven millimeters in diameter. This fetoscope is inserted through mom's abdomen, through the uterus, into the baby's mouth, into the windpipe. And through the lumen of the fetoscope, we advance a very small catheter with a balloon on the end of it inflate that balloon, and then remove the catheter and the fetoscope, and it remains in situ and allows these lungs to grow and develop. This is a fetal bronchoscopy performed at 28 weeks gestation on a human baby with severe diaphragmatic hernia. And if we can run that video, what you're looking at is the left main stem bronchus, the right upper lobe bronchus, and the bronchus intermedius. And this is exactly where we place this tracheal balloon. And it doesn't look like that video is going to run. This balloon is deployed. It's left in place by just gently tugging on the catheter. 
and we leave it in place for about four weeks. Come back in by the same means, pop the balloon, and remove that. And in the meantime, these lungs have undergone significant accelerated growth and development and puts the baby in a completely different... Uh, oh, there we go. So you're looking at the trachea, and here's the catheter being advanced, and it's got the balloon on it. Now that catheter is really only about two millimeters in diameter, just to give you some sense of size and perspective. And once it's in position, we blow it up as you see here, and we basically then can tug on that and remove it. Now, that's just one example of how we can think differently about utilizing the underlying fetal development to our advantage to treat many different conditions. So here's another example. This is a fetal lamb at mid-gestation that we've made a very long incision in the flank here and sutured closed. And this is one week later. It heals without any scar formation. The fetus can regenerate tissue. There's no scar tissue. Think of the implications that has for conditions that we treat all the time that are associated with scarring. Pulmonary fibrosis, cirrhosis of the liver, scleroderma, burn worm contractures, all of which have fundamentally central to their pathophysiology the presence of scar. Here's another example. This is a fetal sheep heart, an adult sheep heart, that we've ligated the, left, the lateral anterior descending coronary artery. And that renders the whole tip of the heart ischemic or with lack of blood flow. This is a heart attack. This is a myocardial infarction. And what happens in the adult is that you get this kind of reaction. This is the ventricle opened up, and this is all scar tissue. So you get inflammation, scar tissue, and this is non-contractile, so these hearts develop heart failure. Well, look what happens if you do the exact same thing in the fetal heart. Essentially, all of this tissue regenerates. You do not get a scar after the exact same kind of myocardial infarction. Think of the implications for the patient who comes to the emergency department with an acute MI in severe pain, compromised myocardial. If we understood better the biology that under, underlies this phenomenon, what an impact we could make. Myocardial infarction is the most common cause of heart failure, and the, the biology is there to potentially prevent its progression. Now, another aspect I'd like to talk to you about is the origin, the fetal origin, of adult disease. This is David Barker. David Barker was a physician and an epidemiologist, and he studied the impact of famine in 1944 in Holland during World War II, specifically in the offspring of mothers who were pregnant during this famine. When they were born and they grew to maturity, it was found that they were 19 times more likely to be obese, diabetic, and hypertensive. And he basically postulated the thrifty phenotype, which is if you're pregnant during a lack of nutrients, whether it's from famine or it's from placental growth uh, insufficiency, you will have this thrifty phenotype, which will predispose you to disease 50 years in the future. And intrauterine growth restriction is a form of this same kind of nutrient restriction. Believe it or not, these are identical twins. This baby is severely growth restricted from placental insufficiency. And there is no effective treatment. So what Barker postulated is that placental insufficiency would cause IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction, and that would result in fetal programming. And that fetal programming would set the stage for disease development 40, 50, 60 years in the future in that organism. And so the question we asked is, if you can be programmed for this kind of outcome, can you be reprogrammed to change the way in which your metabolic destiny is set up for you? And to do this, we had to create a model of placental insufficiency. Two-thirds of all IUGR, growth restriction, 
is caused by placental insufficiency. And there are a lot of potential contributing factors, whether it's the way the placenta implants, de decreased microvascular growth, decreased placental size, and there are numerous growth factors that are deficient, most importantly of which is IGF-1, as we'll talk about. So we had to create a mouse model. There wasn't one that was available. And what we did to do this, and this is a schematic of what the uterus looks like. So this is the vaginal end of the uterus, down here, and these are the ovarian ends. Well, for consistency, we couldn't use those closest to the origin of the artery, so the position five was out, and those too far away from the origin of the vessel were out. And then we wanted to use not the ones that had a single vessel perfusing the gestational unit, but those that had two, and we would just ligate one of these, and then use the corresponding other side as the control and look at their effect on birth weight, gene expression, IGF-1 production. So this is an actual mouse uterus. Here's the gestational unit. There are two vessels. We ligated this one, and this will be our experimental pup. And the same position on the contralateral side will be the control. And what we found with these growth-restricted pups were, in fact, much, much smaller than their litter mates. They were less than the 10th percentile. And their placentas actually had the same gene expression as human uh, gestations that were complicated by growth restriction. So then the question became, can we alter the tra trajectory of these babies, these pups' growth postnatally? Now, I mentioned insulin-like growth factor. This is an important growth factor both in adult disease as well as in utero. And in the adults, you see decreased levels in these diseases that we're worried about, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes. And there are also profoundly reduced levels of IGF-1 uh, in IUGR, both in the serum and the blood. And if you knock this gene out, the mice will be 40% smaller in weight. So it wasn't enough to just give that protein back. We actually had to achieve very high levels for a short period of time. And to do that, we used gene therapy. So transferring this gene so it would be overexpressed. And we did it to the placenta which is the ideal organ, because if you think about it, it's probably the only organ we have that you throw away after you're done using it. And so if we do gene transfer, it will be eliminated at the end of the pregnancy. So we used an adenoviral contract, basically what causes common cold, to do our gene transfer by direct injection. And what we found, here are the control group, their normal weights, the IUGR pups, and those treated by IGF-1 were completely normalized in terms of their birth weight. We then looked at their growth. And even though these pups were very small when they were growing, within five weeks they had caught up to their litter mates, but their trajectory was on a course that would set them up for the development of obesity. In contrast, what we saw with the IGF-1 treated was essentially mimicking those of the normal pups. In addition, when we looked at glucose tolerance tests, so here you have glucose levels on the y-axis, and you have 30, uh, 15, 30, 60 minutes, 120 minutes later. The red is our control group. The yellow is our IUGR pups who, are, who have elevated glucoses or glucose intolerance. And here's our IGF-1 treated. Not only did they have trajectory for obesity and diabetes, but our IUGR animals actually were hypertensive. So these are blood pressure measurements, systolic and diastolic. And here you can see the measurements on the y-axis. The red is our control, the normal controls. Look how much higher the systolic blood pressures were of the IUGR mice. But then if you look at the effect of treating with IGF-1, it completely normalized their blood pressures. And not only were their blood pressures abnormal, but they develop a dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is an echocardiogram of this dilated ventricle, which is poorly contracting, compared to the IGF-1, which is a normal-sized ventricle with excellent contraction. 
So severe end organ injury as a result. So IGF-1 was able to restore weight at birth as well as the growth trajectory. These animals do not become obese. They do not become diabetic. They don't become hypertensive and they don't develop a cardiomyopathy. Essentially, we've been able to reprogram the fate of those animals who were treated. And if you step back from this a little bit, the idea that treating in utero could change the trajectory of the metabolic fate of, an, of a person 40, 50, 60 years in the future. Now, this is a mouse. We're talking about humans. And we obviously can't set the clock back 50, 60 years for those of you who might be diabetic or have high blood pressure. But if we understood the basic biologic underpinnings of this phenomenon, it might open the door to many different ways to treat conditions that we don't have currently. And as Samuel Taylor Coleridge observed back in 1803, the fetus has much to tell us. And there may truly be moments, uh, issues of great moment in the, in the fetus if we can just harvest the lessons that are there for us to learn with implications not only for fetal intervention, but also medicine in general. Thank you very much. Thank you.